where do I fall short? Am I ever going to fix that? Those kinds of very difficult questions. Am I even, do I even want to be here? Those sorts of difficult questions are things you don't learn in leadership classes. You learn those being real quiet, sitting by yourself. I'm trying to watch the time here. What do we got, about five or six more minutes? Ten more. I think another thing that's really important to understand, um, which I, I, again, you know, it took me a long time, is that there's a difference between leadership and management. And leadership is such a amorphous term. And I've, I've come up with a definition of it that, that helps. It's not the complete definition. But the difference between leadership and management is that managers make rational responses to complexity. And in this novel, Mellis shows up on a hill with a rifle company and a platoon, and he doesn't know anybody's name. He doesn't know exactly where they are. He's, he doesn't have a clue about the tactical situation. He is in over his head. And that will happen. And what he has to do is he has to get this enormous complexity under his, under his control. That's, that's called a manager. A leader is somebody that responds to change. He responds to things that aren't ordinary. The leader responds to what has suddenly happened because you'll, you'll see in this book, they, they try to make plans all the time. And as soon as the plan is finished, the, it's changing. Why? Because the enemy is trying to mess it up. You know, it's not like you make a plan and then say, oh, we'll just follow this plan out. You make a plan and then someone on the other side is going, I'm going to mess this plan up. So it's going to be messed up. So the leader is the one that has to react to all those changes. That's not managing complexity. That's managing change. And you'll notice that uh, uh, Blakely, who is, the, who is the villain, the operations officer, is a wonderful manager. He, he's good. He gets the helicopters there. He gets things done. But he's not a leader because he doesn't, doesn't focus on two things, other people going outward instead of inward, and he also isn't focused on change. And um, I think that those are the, the two key things that you, that you should think about yourself when you're, when you're looking at this, at this difference. And what am I doing now? Now am I managing or am I leading? And you have to do both. You have to do both. But you have to learn when it's time to lead and when it's time to manage. And one of the biggest problems that you see in any organization, and I've run a corporation, is that people will continue to manage when they should be leading. Because it's easier. You do what's in front of you. You've already managed. You already understand the complexity of the situation. Why would you want to have to make big changes? Because you've just finally learned your ropes. Well, let me tell you, the, the ropes will change all the time. So there was one other thing that, that I, I wanted to talk about in, in the novel that I think is important to understand, is that you're going to be in positions of power. What is power? Power is the ability to reward or punish people. It's that simple. You think about it. If somebody has power over you, it's because you, they've got something you want, or they can take away something that you've got. It's that simple. And you will be given a lot of power, because you're going to be put into positions of leadership where you can, in fact, make it really hard on people, and you can reward people. Power is not leadership. And there's an example of leadership in this novel that is done with no power at all. And it's a, a character named Hawk, who's the executive officer, who is sort of, Hawk means Gawain in, in Middle Welsh. And, and this is, he is sort of the true knight of, of the novel. And he has his company, he's, he's left the company, and the company's gotten surrounded, and they're in terrible trouble. And he's down in the flatlands being the assistant, assistant operations officer the three Zulu, as it was called. And he decides that he can't stand it any longer. And he just needs to rejoin his company. So he sacrifices his career. He, gives, he, he disobeys orders. He goes out on an LZ. And he sits down with a bunch of brand new kids who have just shown up in country who know that when the, when the fog clears and the choppers start flying, 
they're going to be dropped in with Bravo Company, who's in the middle of a very big shit sandwich. And they're scared. Hawk walks in to this group of people. There's no, there's no rank insignia. When you're in combat, there's no rank insignia. And Hawk looked just as disheveled and dirty as anybody else. Who was this guy? But instantly they knew something, something was going on. He had no authority over them at all, other than, you know, if he told him he was a lieutenant, that would have helped. But, you know, we call it things like command presence. What did Hawk really have? Hawk immediately communicated to these people that he was concerned. He was concerned about them. He could tell that they were scared. He was concerned about the fact that he had to get up on the hill because they were running out of ammunition. He was, and, and he communicated to them that there was something bigger about what he was all about, which was helping the company on the hill, helping them. He also happened to have a really terrific sense of humor, which, which is another thing that, believe me, helps a great deal, um, and perspective. Um, one of the scenes in the, in the novel is, is uh, when a new lieutenant has to take over his, his platoon. And he takes over this platoon in the middle of, they've just come back from a long operation, and half of them are drunk and half of them are stoned. And this new lieutenant who comes from, from uh, uh, the Naval Academy is going like, oh my God, what do we do here? And he has to, he has to put some perspective on it. If I pull rank here and, and go with the standard school solution, that may not be the smart thing to do. Maybe we, can, maybe we can tighten up the discipline in a few hours. It's that kind of judgment call. And I'm not, I'm not telling you, there's no, there are times when you should do it right away, and there are times when you shouldn't. And, and this, this gaining of perspective is something. But before you, make a, a, before you make a move with the rules, like a bam, like that, count to 10 and think, is this the right time to apply it? And that goes back to what are we trying to do here? Are we trying to enforce the rules or are we trying to get the mission done? Are we trying to enforce the rules or are we trying to get these people safer? Sometimes the rules get in the way and that's part of what Mellis learns uh, toward the end of the novel. So I, I think that we're gonna uh, open it up to uh, uh, questions now and uh, if I could just leave you with, with what I think is the most important thing, which is the one I started with, is, you know, Socrates. Know yourself. Accept your flaws. Understand that you're human. Understand that you're in a profession unlike any other. Unlike any other, you have got to accept that you're in the, you're in the business of life and death. And it's serious. And at the same time, you can have a sense of humor about it, and that'll help. So, if we could open up to questions. Wait, we're here. Sir, second class 10. Mm -hmm. What led you to uh, write your book and what made you feel like that would help? Yeah, the. Um, you know, I often wondered that myself. Uh, I spent 35 years, you know, trying to get it published. I actually got it written, uh, the first draft, and tried to get that published in 1977, before any of you were born. And uh, it was a very unpopular war. And, you know, uh, an unknown fiction writer about a war that nobody wanted to read about, uh, all the people that were reading my query letters, and I wrote, I got books how to write killer query letters, just wouldn't even read the manuscript. And, and I put up with that for a long time, and someone had asked me a question just like that. And, I'll, and I realized when that first question was asked what it was, I deal in images, that's what comes to my brain most often. And the image that hit me when that question was asked is that I, would, I had just been assigned to headquarters Marine Corps, and uh, I worked in an annex of the Pentagon, and I had to tar carry some papers to the White House. And so I'm in my full uniform, and I'm uh, just back from Vietnam about two months. And I'm walking down uh, the street about two blocks from the White House. And across the street was a pretty large group of, of angry students who were waving North Vietnamese flags and Viet Cong flags and uh, uh, shouting obscenities at me, uh, you know, calling me names. And I was stunned. I just, it's our nation's capital. 
and everybody's walking by, nobody's going to help. And I'm going like, well, you can't run across the 